Before we even get started, I want to say thank you to each and every one of you for taking time out to hang out with me and talk about guitar playing, okay? So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, this will probably be a little less than an hour, somewhere around there, and I'm gonna be telling you all, all kinds of different things that you can utilize to better approach your guitar playing. And uh, I'm gonna show you all kinds of different stuff. So, there is a PDF that um, will help you a little bit with this. And if you look over, I think it's over in the chat area over there. If you look over there, there's gonna be, um, um, uh, what is it called? There's going to be a sticky, like a sticky note over there somewhere that you should be able to click on and then download the PDF. So you just have to look for that. Hey everybody, thank you so much. I see more and more people are showing up. This is great. Um, so again, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be talking about five tips, five tips to, uh, to better help your acoustic guitar playing. Okay. Now some of these are going to be skills and some of these are just going to be things I want you to really think about. Um, you know, the, the most important thing for me is that number one, you never give up and number two, you enjoy the journey. That's what this whole thing is about. Okay. So I'm going to be giving you five things to think about today and to practice and different stuff like that. Let's just go ahead and get started. So let's look at the first one. If you've got your PDF and again, you should be able to click on the little, there should be a little sticky note or a little link over by the chat. Um, where you can click on that and you can download the PDF. So please make sure that you do that while I'm talking here. That way we get it done right away and we can get into everything else. Okay, if you've got your guitar handy, which I hope you do, depending on what time it is where you're at, okay, um, it'll help to have your guitar handy as well. So let's make sure that you're just tuned up real quick. I'm just gonna go through these notes super quick and then we'll keep going. So here's your six string, E. and your fifth string A, and D, and G, and second string B, and the first string high E. All right, perfect. So, Okay, so hopefully you've got your guitar. If you need a pencil or anything like that, grab that real quick so uh, you're ready to go when we start talking here. And again, I see more people are showing up. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. I'm gonna give you all kinds of really great stuff to think about, some stuff to practice, okay? So let's go ahead and get started. Five tips for every, every guitar player, every acoustic guitar player should know. And even if you play electric, these things are gonna help you, but uh, I wanna focus today just a little bit more on the acoustic guitar itself. Now, you'll see I'm playing a Paul Reed Smith acoustic guitar right now. This one's acoustic electric. And we're going to be talking about this in just a second here because the first one, go ahead and get that PDF. Again, it's linked over there. You should be able to click on it and download the PDF. Okay? And my PDF will be right here. Okay, perfect. So, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, number one, this is really important and it's very simple, but people forget it all the time, okay? Comfort. You gotta be comfortable, okay? When you play guitar, you gotta make sure that you've got the right guitar. You gotta make sure you've got the right guitar pick. You gotta make sure that you're holding this guitar correctly, okay? All of these things make all the difference in the world. I love to play guitar. I play all the time. I play every day. I don't want to fight the instrument. I want to play the instrument. I want to create on the instrument. I want to enjoy the time I have uh, while I'm doing this. So I like a guitar that feels comfortable. Comfort does not necessarily uh, equate to cost, okay? So I want to talk about that a little bit. So the first thing is, is in comfort, if you look at your PDF, it'll say guitar, okay? This one right here is my Paul Reed Smith. It's not an overly expensive guitar. It feels really great to me. Um, what this guitar is, is it's relatively thin, uh, so I can play it standing up, things like that. But because I'm a smaller guy, it's easy for my arm to come around and be comfortable. The neck on it is incredibly in comfortable. And again, I'm not endorsing Paul Reed Smith. I'm not saying go out and buy one. I'm saying this guitar, let me show you. I've got this one sitting right here. This is my Martin, okay? Now this Martin, is much more expensive than my Paul Reed Smith. 
when I'm sitting around and I grab a guitar, I tend to grab this one more often than I do the Martin. Not that I don't love the Martin. Martin sounds amazing. This one feels better to me, even though it's a lot less expensive. It just feels more comfortable because of my body size. You know, it sits right on my leg very, very comfortably. And uh, yeah, it just feels good. The neck, the neck on this thing is amazing for me. Um, the strings all feel really good, so it's easy for me to play stuff. So I really want you to take into consideration that when you're you're starting your guitar journey or you're on this guitar journey, that sometimes the issues that you you encounter aren't always just you. Sometimes they have a lot to do with the gear that you're using, right? So it's important to think about that. Find the guitar that fits you best. If you're not sure what you need, go to a guitar store that you trust. Go in and, and have them help you a little bit in finding something, okay? Don't just assume that because it's expensive, it should play better or it should feel better to you. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So it's really important to think about that. The comfortability of this guitar means everything. The body size, the neck size, all of these different things, okay? So that's the first thing I really want you to think about because it's so easy for us as musicians, as guitar players to get um, distracted by the bright lights. We walk in and we see all these guitars and we go, oh, that's amazing and I love it. But it, it, we have to be realistic too and find the thing that works best for us. Okay, the next thing I've got in the, the uh, list is strings. The thickness of the strings that you put on the guitar. Again, it makes all the difference in the world in the comfortability of your guitar. The guitar comes with a certain gauge of string on there and that's that gauge that co it comes up with might be perfect for you, which is great, but it might not, okay? If you find that you're fighting the guitar, you could give consideration to getting a little bit thinner gauge of string put on. There's all kinds of different guitar strings out there um, and all different thicknesses. And, and again, I don't expect you to have all the answers, but this is something that you could start researching a little bit and talking to other guitar players about, whether it's in the Guitar Zoom community or, um, you know, talk to me, talk to other people there or friends that you have or, you know, people at your local guitar store or whatever it might be. These things make a big difference in your success. So for me, I keep a fairly light gauge string because it's easier for me to do the things that I like to do on the guitar. It just feels better. Whether it's my Martin or whether it's my, my Paul Reed Smith. I'm pointing to my Martin because it's sitting right here, uh, even though you can't see it. Okay. And then the third thing is the guitar pick that you're using. It, it, as small as it seems, it makes a big difference on comfortability, whether or not you want to pick that's fairly thin or fairly thick, right? Or a bigger pick or a smaller pick. And again, there's no beginner pick and advanced pick. Like people get this weird, you know, misconception that like a thinner pick is for a beginner and then a thicker pick is for an advanced player. And that couldn't be further from the truth. It's just finding what works for you. Um, I used to work at a music store for many years and I used to tell people when they'd come in and they'd want to buy picks, you know, as a gift for their son or daughter or husband or wife or whatever it might be. And they wouldn't know what the, the person would want. And I would always tell them, well, just buy a variety, you know, just buy a bunch of different picks and then th let the person choose, let the person find what, what they like. Um, you just got to have some fun with this stuff, but don't just assume because it all came in a pack that that's that it's set up and it, it's, it's going to fit you as an individual. You need to think about that a little bit. So in the Play Acoustic Now uh, guitar course that I got, we're going to be talking about all of these things in detail. We're going to be talking about not only how to hold the guitar properly and all these different kinds of things, but different kinds of gear and, and the differences that they, that they, the impacts that they have on your success. So those are things that we're going to be talking about. Okay. Um, and then letter or uh, letter D there. Sorry, I have to look over there to see my notes. So we have comfort, which is number one, guitar strings, picks, and letter D is environment. Okay. Environment. This is really important. You should be able to practice somewhere where you feel good, where you feel comfortable, be in a chair that feels good to you, right? Um, be in a room that's the right temperature. You know, all these different kinds of things make a really big difference on your success. For me, you know, as I get older, I, I fight arthritis and different things like that. And so 
it's always important that when I'm in my room or in my studio or whatever it might be, that I've got the temperature set to where everything feels really good. Um, we're going to get into distractions and stuff in a little while, but the other thing is, is I like it to be quiet. I, you know, I love my kids and, and all those things that I spend a lot of time with them. But when it comes time to practice, I, I need to be in the right place uh, so I can focus on things. Okay. So just think about those four things a little bit. And I know they seem simple, but they make all the difference in the world. If you, which you might be, and as a matter of fact, let me ask you this and you can, you can respond. Have you ever had a guitar that you really loved, but then realized that it just wasn't you. It just didn't work for you. Okay. Now there's a little delay, so I'll, I'll wait for your answers to come in, but think about that. Have you ever had a guitar or even maybe now you do have a guitar that you really love that guitar, but for some reason that guitar just do, it, it doesn't fit you. It doesn't work for you. There's another guitar that you've got that just seems to work way better. Okay, cool. So I'm seeing that people are responding and saying, yes, it's a very common thing. Okay. You don't know what you don't know, right? That's a, a saying that a friend of mine told me a long time ago, which I just think is wonderful. Uh, you don't know. I mean, you know, if you first start learning how to play and you go in a guitar store and they sell you something, you assume that it's perfect, but you just don't know until you've been playing for a little while. But I do want you to, to, to think about the fact that these four elements really make a big difference on your success, especially the right guitar, the right strings, and then to a lesser degree, but certainly important is the guitar pick and then the environment that in which you're practicing, right? Is it a positive environment or the people around you are encouraging, right? And if they're not, <laughs> you need to stay away from them, right? You got to stop with the whole, I'm not good enough, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Everybody has an equal chance at this instrument, okay? Regardless of whether you've got musical background, your parents, blah, blah, blah. I didn't have any of that stuff when I first started playing. It was just grit, just a lot of practice. That's what it was. And paying attention, obviously. All right, so that's the first thing, okay? Think about that a little bit. All right, let's move on to number two. Okay, now we're going to get into it a little bit. Number two is connectivity, and you'll notice I tried to, to make this slick by having everything start with a C. So the first one was comfort. The second one is connectivity. Okay. So connectivity, what we're going to be talking about here, are all kinds of different things, but really what this comes down to is your ability to connect physical and, uh, thought processes on your fretboard. Okay. How to make these connections. So let's start with something really straightforward since you've got your guitar right there. It doesn't matter whether you're learning open chords or you're learning bar chords. Okay. Or you're learning power chords. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. The big thing is, are they comfortable to you? Whatever it is that you know in your head right now, think about this. Just think about a style of chord or a chord itself, whether they're open chords or bar chords or power chords, whether it's a G chord or a D chord or an E minor chord or whatever it might be. Think about the ones that are easy for you and then think about the ones that you struggle with. Okay. Now, I don't know how, how long you've been playing, but I've been playing a really long time. And my whole philosophy is, is I'm, I'm th there, there came a time in my life when I was satisfied with my playing. I enjoyed the way it felt and I was proud of the way it sounded, but my journey is never over. Anything that I do can always be better from a simple G chord to a crazy scale. No matter what it is I do on this instrument, I can always strive to be better. Not in a negative way, right? It's not, I suck, I can't do this and it needs to be better. It's just understanding that the journey never ends. I can continue to, I watch people all the time, whether they're friends of mine or people on social media, YouTube, whatever it might be. And I'm always inspired by people, regardless of their age or anything like that, on the way that they play and it makes me want to play. Okay. So wherever you are in your journey with chords, understand that your job is to make this connectivity of each chord and then groups of chords more efficient, more connected, more confident. 
So let's look at this. The first one we're going to do is talk about bouncing. Now, you may have heard me talk about this before, but I cannot or, uh, over, uh, overemphasize, I think is the word I'm looking for, the importance of this. Okay. In my mind, it's not how much information you have. It's how much information you are truly, truly comfortable with that you can use in real world situations. When you're with other musicians or, you know, you're going to get together with a band or you're going to play at church or whatever it might be. If you walk in and you're panicked and you're not sure what to do and you don't know how things go, you can't use any of that information regardless of how good you thought you were when you were at home by yourself, right? It's, it's the power that you have with truly understanding the pieces of this learning journey, the, the power that you have in really understanding those things. So let's just take something like a G chord. Okay. Now you might know G bar chord or whatever. You can use any example that you want, but just make me a chord on the guitar. Okay. Now what bouncing is, is your availability of being able to make that chord as quickly and accurately as humanly possible. And the way to do that is through muscle memory. You have to train your hand to make that shape, whether it's a chord, whether it's a scale, it could be all sorts of different things as quickly as possible. And the way that you do that is through bouncing. The first thing is visualization. If I say to you, okay, I'd like you to make me a G chord. The first thing you need to be able to do is make a picture in your head of what G means to you. Is it this G? Is it this G? Is it this G? Is it this G? What, what G are you thinking of, right? Whatever it is that you're thinking of is what you're going to go to. If you can't really see it, let's say I said to you, okay, play me a B flat minor seven flat nine. You either see it or you don't, right? If you don't see it, you can't play it. And even if you could play it, it's certainly not going to be quick. So the goal is for me, it's not how much information you have. It's the information that you have has got to be crucial to your day-to-day -day practice. Chords are crucial. I don't care if you want to be the greatest guitar soloist in the world. You need to know chords. You need to know how they connect on the fretboard. So being able to see that chord in your head, the next thing that you do is what I refer to as bouncing. So let's make again, whatever chord you want. For me, it's G. Okay. So with this G chord, what I want to do is I want to pretend like my fingers are super glued together and I want to pick them up and then set them back down and pick them up and set them back down. And as I pick it up, you'll notice I'm not doing this. I'm retaining the shape. I'm training my hand to make this shape. So when I want G, it just sets down. Okay. So that's what bouncing is, is you picked it up and you set it back down. You picked it up, you set it back down. It's not how fast you pick it up and set it down. It's none of those things. Actually, it's even more beneficial for you if you pick it up and hold it for a while and then set it down. Cause see the big mistake that I always used to make is when I would, when I would make chords, when I was a kid, I'd make a chord and then I'd strum it. But I wasn't training myself to make the chord. The chord was made. Once I've made it, I can forget about it because my fingers aren't going to, it's not like I'm going to look away and go, Hey, what happened? Right? They're, they're going to stay there. So they're not really learning anything. If I do this and I set them up there, you know, think about if, you know, if you're an absolute beginner or you know somebody who's a beginner, when you, you know, help them put their fingers in the right places, it's not like they go, Oh, got it. Perfect. Now I can do it. No, you got to train yourself by, by that muscle memory, by doing it over and over and over again. Okay. So here's what I always tell people. If you were in class with me, here's what I always tell people. I have them put their hand on their lap and I say, I'm going to count to three. And if you can make that chord faster than me, I will buy you a candy bar. I'll buy you a pizza. I don't know, whatever it might be. Just pick something. Right. So then they get all excited. Of course I can cheat cause I'm the one counting. Right. But the point is, is when I count to three, what usually happens is they go like this and they get up there and then they have to build the chord because they're in, they're, they're so excited to try and get there before I get there. So instead of thinking about smooth and steady, they just panic and try and get up there and then try and make the chord or had they done this and just picked up, made the chord shape and set it down, right? they'd get there a lot faster than trying to go and then try and build the cord when they get there. 
building the cord when you get to the fretboard is never going to work for you. Okay, you're better off slowing the whole process down and learning how to bounce that chord shape. Okay, again, regardless whether you're learning open chords, bar chords, power chords, cage chords, all these different things, we'll talk about all this kind of stuff in Play Acoustic Now all over the fretboard. And again, we'll get to that in a little while. It doesn't matter what you're working on. It can always be better. It can always be more efficient. It can always be more confident for you. The more, the better you understand what you're trying to do. Okay. The next thing we're going to talk about is B under uh, number two connectivity. It's called lift and shift. Now, once you've bounced whatever your chords are for whatever song you might be playing, whether you're again, playing open chords or let's say I was playing, um, We'll use Blues Traveler, if you remember Blues Traveler. Let me know if you remember Blues Traveler. I used to love this band. Um, they have a song called Hook, and it looks like this. Let's see. C, okay, so here it goes. I gotta remember how it goes. There it is. Okay, so what I want you to notice about this, I can play this all kinds of different ways on the guitar and whatever, but it's going from an A to an E to an F sharp minor, which is a bar chord, to a C sharp major, which is a bar chord, to a D major, which I played down here, to an A, to a D, to an E. Again, I'm not asking you to learn this song right now, okay? I'm just using it as an example, just off the top of my head. So in order to play this song, I have to be able to, to first visualize the chords and the chord progression that's happening here, this connectivity. I need to be able to see each one of those chords and to define where I want to play them on my fretboard. And I need to be able to see how they all connect together. Okay. Now I haven't played the song in a really long time, so it took me a second to figure out whether it was C sharp minor or C sharp major, and it's most certainly C sharp major. So I can see this chord progression in my head. I'm thinking A, E, F sharp minor, C sharp, and then D, A, D, E. So you'll see I've kind of broken it into two groups of four. A, E, F sharp minor, C sharp, and then D, A, D, E. That's how I visualize things in my head when I play songs. So I'm not really looking at like a sheet of paper and, you know, trying to do all this kind of stuff. I'm visualizing how the song should go. So as I'm listening to this song, and of course you'll learn ear training stuff in Play Acoustic Now as well. But as I'm listening to this song, I'm thinking about those eight chord changes as he's singing. So I've got A, B, F sharp minor, C sharp, D, A, D, E. Now, right now, you could either play this song or not, depending on how well you know your chords. It's the bottom line. Now, I'm not trying to freak you out. If you don't know your bar chords yet, don't worry about it. There's a billion other songs you can learn how to play. What I'm saying is I chose this song in particular because it uses open and bar chords together. It uses a bunch of different chords. So I have to be able to visualize all of these chords in whatever places I want to play them. And I've got to be able to connect them. Lifting and shifting is what we're talking about. When I lift and shift, it means I'm making a chord, but because I've bounced all of these chords, right? I've practiced all these various different pieces. Lifting and shifting means I pick my fingers up and I shift to the next shape. Now I got to go to an F sharp minor, which is a bar chord. So I lift and shift. Then I need to go to a fifth string major bar chord. So I lift and shift. And that's how I get to these chords on time. If I have to move and then build each time, I'm going to be late. And I know you know what I'm talking about because this happens all the time when people try and play songs. When people try and play music, either their tools, so to speak, their chords are not fully developed for in general or for that particular song. Let's say you're just learning how to play open chords right now. Hook is not a good song for you to practice. It's just not. It doesn't mean you, sh you, don't, you, you shouldn't try it or have some fun or whatever. That's great. But learning to, to choose the right things to your wheelhouse, 
to your environment. If right now all you know how to play very well is G, C, and D, you should learn some songs that have G, C, and D in them. Why on earth would you practice G, C, and D really hard and then learn a song that has F sharp minor and C sharp and whatever and doesn't even have G, C, and D in it? You see what I'm saying? So we tend to get distracted because we always want to play songs and things. So all of a sudden we love a song, which is great, but the song is not in our wheelhouse. It's not where we are on our journey. So all of a sudden we completely bypass our journey to go to this completely new direction. And then we wonder why we can't make the connection when this stuff over here is what we were practicing. And now we're over here. Well, now we're practicing completely uncharted territory and we're not really paying any attention to what we were doing before. I'm going to say this one more time to make sure you understand. I'm not saying that it's wrong to get sidetracked and do different things or go off your path. It's wonderful. But if you do it all the time, you have no direction. You have no organization. You see, so learning how to bounce these chords, learning how to shift and lift and shift between the chords and more important. Well, I shouldn't say more importantly, but equally as important is sticking with chords that are relative to where you are on your journey. Okay. Everybody that's watching me right now, either you're playing open chords or you're playing bar chords or you're playing power chords or you're learning a cage chord system or whatever it might be. You're all in different places. Everybody's in different places. Everybody. Okay. So the trick is, is to be able to reel all of that information in and start making a plan. So I digress. Um, so let's keep going here. Uh, C. Okay. Letter C of connectivity, visualization of the fretboard. This is really important. And this is what I was just kind of leaning into with the song. Okay. Learning how to see chords across your guitar or scales across your guitar. And again, I talk about all these things in the course, but you want to have options. If I just told you again, hook by blues Traveler is my example. I could have played a here, but I could have played a here or I could have played a here. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of different places I could have played a, so as soon as somebody said to me, Hey, Steve, uh, can you play hook or would you be willing to play hook with us or whatever it might be? As soon as I start formulating these chords and the progression that they're in the order that they're in, then I start planning out where do I want to go? Right? Maybe I play E here or a here, excuse me, E up here, F sharp. There we go. Now I got one. So I'm going to go A, E, F sharp minor, C sharp, D, A, D. Maybe I drop down or whatever. I'm just saying the better I know my fretboard, the more options that I have. Visualization of things across your entire fretboard open up your possibilities so you're not always stuck in that one same spot. It's pretty cool. It's not the first step. Again, always keep in mind your wheelhouse, your world and logically figure out what comes next. And again, I do this all in the course anyway, but it's just really important for you to think about that. Okay. So it, it doesn't make any sense to be trying to do it the way I'm doing it right now. If you're learning open chords, what makes more sense is to find a song that uses the chords that you're playing. There's a million different ways to do that. You know, you can use the internet and, I always tell people like if you go on Google and you just type in songs with GCD or whatever, you're going to find all kinds of different things out there. Okay. So just think about that a little bit. So learning to visualize across your fretboard is just going to open up a lot of creativity and a lot of freedom for you when you're playing chords and scales and different things like that. But that should be a step after you've already established some of these core elements of learning the most useful and used chords that we play in guitar, like G and C and D and A minor and E minor and different things like that. So again, I'm always aware that I'm not talking to, you know, just one person on one journey. We're all on different journeys. Okay. But there's some real fundamental elements that we, each one of us, including myself need to think about, which is, you know, I want to be able to play jazz and I want to be able to play rock and I want to be able to play country and I want to be able to play blues and I want to be able to play acoustic. And I want to play electric and I want to play metal and that's great. You can do all these things, but
but you got to have a step-by-step -step program to get you there. You have to have a step-by-step -step mindset to develop all these things. Otherwise you wind up with scattered little ideas all over the place and none of them are really developed and you can't really do anything. Cause every time you turn on your phone or your TV or your computer or a magazine, you're just swamped with a bunch of new things. And then you're constantly distracted going, well, I don't even know where I'm supposed to go. Okay. That's why guys like me create guitar courses to organize a path for you. That's the point. So hopefully that makes sense. All right. Let's look at practical theory, music theory. Oh, everybody freaks out when you talk about music theory because it's so complicating. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. You don't need to be doing, you know, I went to college. You don't need to be doing my, my third year music theory stuff for a regular guitar player in the world. Okay. Unless you're trying to play a bunch of classical music and trying to compose stuff for orchestra, you don't need all of those sorts of things. And sometimes you don't even need it even if you are doing those things. Okay. Real world, practical, fundamental, usable theory is what you need. Okay. Now I have guitar courses that cover all kinds of different theory things, but learning practical theory, what do I mean? When I first started learning how to play, I learned very early on that G and C and D were used together all the time. I had no idea why but I just knew that they were used together because I would see it over and over and over when I would play songs. Anybody name that song? <laughs> I'll give you a second to see if you know what that is. Okay. I'll give you another one. Obviously you know this one. right? GCD. They're used together all the time. I didn't understand why I already had real world theory going on in my brain. I didn't have words for it, but I knew that these things went together. Practical theory is learning that when you're in a key and key meaning there's a primary chord, a primary note, a primary chord, you're going to go to other places, but you're always going to come back to that primary chord. So when we say, Oh, we're in the key of G, it means the G chord is home plate. It's home base. Okay. And you're going to go to other bases, but you're always going to come back to that home base. Okay. So G and C and D, if we count up on our fingers, we have G, A, B, C, D, because in music theory, we only have the notes A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. We don't have an H or an I or something like that. So when you get A, B, C, D, F, G, when you get to G, you just start all over on A again. So for me, I was teach. It's actually easier if you think about it in a circle, you're just going A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Now in talking like that, it seems like A is more important. It's not. If you want to be in the, the key of A, A is more important, but if you want to be in the key of G, G is more important. So you have G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so on. So if you think about it, G, A, B, C, D. G, C, D, one, four, five. We call it a one, four, five, and I'm not going to go into great detail with that, but if you've ever heard the term one, four, five, that's what we're talking about. It's the first chord, the fourth chord, and the fifth chord in whatever key you're in. The one, four, five is the single most popular chord progression on the history of the planet. Okay. It just is one, four, five. So we use one, four, fives if we're in the key of G. <laughs> We use one, four, five, if we're in the key of D, which is D, G, A. These are, pr this is practical theory, real world theory that you can use. Why? Number one, because you can anticipate what people are going to play or what songs you want to learn by ear, which is the next thing I think on there. Yeah. E ear training. Okay. The more you learn about practical theory, the more you can anticipate what the songs are going to be doing that you want to learn without having to always look at music, sheet music, or, you know, go to a website or whatever it might be. Cause you get used to it. If you start playing in the first chord is G, I already have ideas in my head. What I expect you to go to next. It doesn't mean it always happens, but it happens a lot. Okay. So it makes my understanding of what you're going to do as a, as a fellow musician, it makes me better understand what I expect from you. When I learn songs, I already have an idea of what goes into those songs. So it's not like I'm going in completely blind 
So the first chord is G and all I see is a blank screen after that. I expect to see C or D or E minor or different things like that. Okay? Songwriting. Again, learning songs by ear. There's a million reasons why you would learn something like this. Okay? Practical theory, which leads to ear training. Okay? So if you're, if you're getting some useful information here, please give me a yes or thumbs up or whatever it is you want to do. Okay? I want to organize you so your journey is better, it's more efficient, it's more fun, okay? The payoff is better. Because so many people struggle with playing this instrument and it goes on for years and years and years. I want you to get yourself organized. I want you to keep getting better. I hope you play for the next 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, and you get better all the time. But you'll get better, I guarantee you, if you've got a plan. Okay, if you organize yourself a little bit. All right, so moving on here, the next thing we're going to talk about is number three, which is huge. And we've already talked about it a little bit, so we could go through this pretty quick. But is concentration. You have incredible ability to concentrate. The problem is, is that you're always being slammed with outside information. Your phone is ringing, your texts are going off, your Facebook, your whatever, your whatever, the TV's on, your kids need food, blah, 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 homework to do, a million different things. So we've developed a term we call multitasking. If you do any research on multitasking, what you learn is multita multitasking is a fraud. You could multitask, but all you're really doing is giving less of the good you to each thing. So instead of giving 100% to something to do a great job on, you're giving this one 20% and this one 15% and this one 25%, whatever it might be, okay? But you're not going full bore into something to really absorb it. If you were my heart surgeon or my brain surgeon, I don't want you multitasking when you're working on me, <laughs> right? I want you focused. I want you thinking about nothing but me. And I'm hoping that your training has led you to the place where as you are working on my brain or whatever it is you're doing, you know what you're doing. Okay, learning how to play guitar is no different, okay? Shut your distractions off. Shut your phone off or leave your phone in another room. Now, stop trying to make excuses, okay? You know what I'm talking about. Focus practicing for me I can do this. I've been doing it my whole life. Sometimes I need to remind myself, okay? But like yesterday, I was driving home and I was listening to something. I was listening to a song that I have to learn for a band. So I was listening to it and then all of a sudden I was just kind of dazed off, talk, you know, looking around, singing along with the song, blah, blah, blah. And then I went, oh, whoops, I got to get back. So as I'm listening to this song, I'm literally imagining the chords and the changes and the connectivity and all these different things as the song is playing. So even when I don't have my guitar with, with me, I, I practice because this thing's going, okay? This is really important. So when you want to practice something, I don't care if it's a scale that you might be working on, you know, let's say you're working on your pentatonics, you know, whatever it might be, or you're working on some bar chords or whatever it might be. Shutting everything else down and just just trying to get into a place where you're really concentrating on something, a technique, a thought, a concept that you're working on, a chord progression, a song, but focusing learning how to truly utilize your brain to, 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 to gain knowledge on whatever it is that you're working on. Because if you take, here's the problem. If you take 15 chords and three scales and 17 licks and blah, 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 and you're trying to practice all of these things in 10 minutes, how good are you really going to get at all of these things in 10 minutes practicing all of these different things? Let's say you only had 20 minutes a day to practice. My, and again, I might be wrong, but my advice to you would be practice less things. Because if you're spending 30 seconds on each thing or a minute and 20 seconds on each thing, are you really going to develop it? Now, 
of course, the argument could be made that we might need to practice a little more than 20 minutes too, but sometimes it's tough, right? So we got to do the best we can. So you have got to understand to be focused. And again, like I said before, less is more for us. Okay. In trying to organize ourselves, if we are, you know, bombarded with 58 different things all the time, and then every day we're, we're introduced to something new, they might be fun and they might be inspiring, which is great. But if they're outside a logical path, they tend to just distract us. Okay. So we got to be careful with that a little bit. All right. Um, and then the next thing uh, you know, under concentration is what I refer to as absolution. And I only use that word because I really don't like the word master. Master sounds like you're better than everybody else. I've mastered something. You know, I put in my 10,000 hours, 10,000 hours. People have said is a lie anyway, because you could spend 10,000 hours. I've probably spent that long on a bike. It doesn't make me a professional, a professional, you know, cyclist or something like that. So, you know, just because you've done something for 10,000 hours doesn't mean that you've been focused for 10,000 hours, right? So absolution for me means you have worked it up to a place where it feels good. You feel good about it. You're confident with what it is and you can utilize it in the real world. That's what absolution is for me. It's at an absolute level. Can it get better? Yes, it can. It can, things can always get better, but it's at a place where you feel good and it sounds good. So when you get together with other people, even if you get nervous, you've got this. That's what absolution is to me. Okay. So let's keep going here. All right. So number four, number four is creating rhythm. This is one of the most important things that I hear from people, people that have been playing for many years, people that have just started is they have a hard time learning how to groove when they play. Oftentimes people start and they, they just go right into scales and things and they never really learn how to play a real grooving rhythm. And again, we'll talk about all this stuff in, in play acoustic now as well, but let's get you something where you're going to be able to walk away from this webinar and go, thanks, that helped. I I've got something. Okay. So the first thing is, is we have the option of strumming patterns. Strumming patterns are when you learn to play a pattern that fits in a certain amount of time, like a measure, right? So you're going, So I'm going down, 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 up, down, 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 up, down, and so on. Now, strumming patterns are important. And to some people, they are essential because it helps them to begin understanding how to move their arm comfortably back and forth smoothly and create something that fits in a space like a measure, right? But let me tell you the downside to strumming patterns. Now, again, I'm not saying I'm opposed to strumming patterns. Sometimes they are necessary and I will use them as needed. Okay. But I'm going to tell you this super quick story. When I was younger, I started teaching my very first guitar class many, many years ago. I started teaching my very first guitar class. I had like 17 people in this class. I made all my own materials, handed out the books. I was so proud of myself, super nervous teaching all these people. And I got to a part in the, the, you know, these all, they were all absolute beginners. So I'm teaching them how to do strumming patterns. So I'm teaching them down, 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 up, down, and whatever different strumming patterns, right? So three or four different strumming patterns. And then we go into some songs and blah, blah, blah. Then the class is over. They all want to take a second class. So boom, we do a second class and then we do a third class. And sometimes these things would go on forever. Like these people would take lessons, which was awesome. They take lessons for a long time. Here's what I started noticing is that these students that I was teaching how to play use the same strumming patterns for everything. So the strumming patterns never became something else. The strumming patterns were what they used for everything that they played. So every time they grab the guitar and play a song, regardless of what song it was, they were going. And that's when the real element of what I was doing and what I was teaching and how I had to change started. Okay. Now again, please understand. I am not saying that strumming patterns are wrong. They are necessary for some people for a period of time. Okay. And yes, some songs do use strumming patterns, but most songs people just strum. 
if you were to sit down with Neil Young or you were to sit down with whoever it might be and say, hey, how did you strum that song? Most of the time they're going to look at you and go, I don't know, I just kind of play. Okay, so if you think about it, as I'm strumming, I'm going to take that same pattern now. If I went like this, and I did that for four straight minutes, you'd probably get kind of bored with hearing that same pattern. It'd almost be like hypnotic after a while because it'd just be the same thing. But if I did something like this, put it in the context of an actual chord progression. So let's say I was doing this. It's going to sound a bit more real, a bit more human, okay? Which leads me to this, and again, I go into a lot more detail with, with this whole thing in the course, but let me get you thinking about this. Organic strumming, which is uh, letter B, okay? Organic strumming. Organic strumming is when you start learning, let's just talk about scratching for a second. Scratching is when you just touch all six strings. Don't push on them, just touch them so you get that sound. Organic strumming is learning how to move the arm like it's a maraca back and forth. And what you do is you start learning how to simply move in and out at different times. You're not planning this. You're not plotting it out. You're just moving the arm like it's a maraca. It just keeps going. If you stop a maraca, the beads fall to the bottom. And you can start again but you can hear that it stopped and started. If you never stop moving the maraca, it keeps the groove going as long as you don't speed up or slow down. Well, the same thing happens when you strum. So all I have to do is move in and start hitting the strings. So if I think about it, this is strumming right here. I'm just not hitting the strings. So what I'm gonna do is just sort of brainlessly move in and move out. Now, there's no rhyme or reason to it at this point. I'm just training myself to unthink strumming patterns. So if my song was going one, two, three, four, one, two, here it is. Now I can decide to start hitting and missing at different times. Now eventually, as I do this more, I can start creating patterns in my head or a general idea But see how it's different? I'm not, I'm not feeling in my brain, I'm not feeling obligated to have to do that same thing for four and a half straight minutes. I get the idea. And you'll see, even when I leave space, my arm is still moving. I'm not going. Because all of a sudden it begins to sound like this. The goal is to keep that maraca moving. So organic strumming is learning, yes, you could start with a pattern or an idea, but you can always move off of that by simply hitting and missing in different places. Be aware that you can start on ups, not just downs. You don't have to go. You know, you can start in an up. Okay. And then the next part of that that I've got written on there is what I refer to as ocean strumming. And an ocean strumming for me is really a way of making you think about dynamics. Because if you think about the, the waves of an ocean, if you've ever seen them before, they're, they're very mesmerizing. And part of the reason for that is, is they're unpredictable. They don't follow a, a similar pattern for 20 minutes. It's not the exact same wave pattern. And when you listen to it, it doesn't sound the same. Some are big, some are small. Some are aggressive, some are gentle. It's all different relative to the environment, obviously. So as you're playing, organic strumming to me is the second layer of, 
um, or excuse me, ocean strumming is kind of the second layer of organic strumming. Ocean strumming is once you've kind of figured out how you're going to move, then you start thinking about hitting and missing in different places or hitting harder or softer in different places to create a dynamic. So you're not just going, but instead you're going, So you're creating this, again, it's, it's where real things come from when you play songs, whether they're your songs or somebody else's songs. That's how you engage a listener. Okay. Now, again, there are different things. If I'm playing a Ramon song, it's a little different. If you know who the Ramones are, I'm bashing through this thing for the most part. Okay. But we are talking about a, an acoustic guitar and the beauty of this acoustic guitar is it's got all of this availability of dynamics. It can be loud and aggressive. And then it can be really quiet and very gentle. There's all these wonderful things that you can do with it. And you can do that within the songs that you learn. Okay. Um, and then number five, the last thing here is again, just letting you know about these different things to think about. And of course they're in the, the guitar course, but is craftsmanship. And because I'm really trying to keep the C word going through all of these craftsmanship for me is techniques. What kinds of stuff can you do on this instrument, right? You can learn flat picking. Not just strumming, but learning how to flat pick. So you can play songs. You can play scale, scales, you know. I'm digging back trying to remember how to play all these songs. You see that that would require me to pick versus strumming. So learning how to pick down and alternate pick and all these different things are really important. Again, are they more important than learning chords? No, because everything I'm doing is built off chords anyway. So again, having a direction, having a path, being organized, understanding that each thing has its place. So start learning how to flat pick when you can't strum or start learning how to flat pick when you can't play chords. It's going out of order and not that you can't do it, but it's going to be less efficient in the long run. So it's really important to think about that. Okay. Um, the other thing I wrote on under flat picking is string control, learning how to control the strings as you play. So you get the right sound. So all the strings aren't ringing out all those kind of things, learning how to control those strings. Okay. Again, there's just, there's a million different things I could tell you, but, but just thinking about that a little bit, that learning how to strum is very different than learning how to pick. Okay. Another thing we talk about is finger picking. Right. Learning how to do things. Learning how to finger pick is really cool, especially for an acoustic guitar. It's definitely a technique that you should learn how to do. So let's just learn something really basic. If you've never done finger picking before, let's just play, make a plain old D chord, just a regular old open D chord. Okay. And here's what you're going to do for now. We're going to use all four of these fingers. There's many ways that you can do this. And I talk about all kinds of them in the course, but let's just look at one way. So what we're going to do is put our thumb on the fourth string, our first finger on the third string, our middle finger on the second string and our ring finger on the first string. Okay. Now when you do this, what I want you to notice is my thumb is a little bit further out. My thumb isn't back here. Okay. My thumb is out here. Kind of like I'm doing a thumbs up. That way when my thumb picks, it doesn't run into my other fingers like this. So what I'm going to do is pluck the thumb and then I'm going to pluck the first finger and then the middle finger and then the third finger. And then I'm going to go back and do it again. So I have, See that? Now, sometimes we'll take our pinky and kind of set it down for stability. Some people like to do that. Some people like to lift it up and just be open out here when they play. But see, what's happening is you're, you're designating fingers to strings. It's not just, you know, 
kind of this sort of thing. You're, everything has a pattern. Everything has a purpose. And it's just learning what those things are. Okay. But if you think that that's something that you might be interested in, look up some, you know, go on Google and type in, you know, basic finger picking if, if it's something you like. Again, if you don't know a D chord, I wouldn't worry about finger picking just yet. Okay. So again, just trying to help you out a little bit with organizing yourself. Other things to think about, needless to say, number uh, three is strumming. We already talked about that, but really crucial technique. Slide guitar playing, which I talked about in the course. Um, I'm not a real huge slide guitar player, but I think it's wonderful. And I certainly think that it's something that um, you might have a lot of fun with. Altered tunings. Again, I'm not going to tune my guitar differently, but learning how to do alternate tunings is, is a really important thing to do. Um, and then soloing skills. You know, in the course, we talk about pentatonics and learning how to do some basic soloing and things like that. Definitely something worth learning. Okay. So again, I, I don't want to go way too far off. I don't want to waste your time because I know your time is valuable, but let me just kind of show you this. Let's say you've never played a scale before. Now you might already know this, but if you don't, let me show you this. This is what we refer to as the minor pentatonic scale. And it's a really important scale for us to learn how to play for a whole host of different reasons that I don't want to go into a three hour discussion about. But what you would do is go to the fifth fret, for instance, if we want to play in the key of A, we want to know the notes on our sixth string, which again, you would learn, okay, in the course. But if we go to A and play that note with our first finger, and then we go to the pinky over here on the eighth fret of the sixth string, we play that. So we have five, eight. Now you might play those with down strums like this and notice I'm just plucking one string or you might play them with alternate strumming we call it or alternate picking where you play down up okay then the next string would be five to seven which you'd use your first finger and your third finger for and then the next string would be five to seven and the next string would be five to seven so so far you can see it's pretty symmetrical it's pretty easy you go five eight and then five seven and five seven and five seven and then you end with two five eights again five to eight which is your pinky and five eight which again is your pinky so again if we go back to what we talked about before with visualization before i'd ever learn to actually want to learn how to play this i got to see it five eight five seven five seven five seven five eight five eight and i would study that i would get that visualization that picture in my brain then I would go and start working on the technique of learning how to play this scale. Okay, now, if I don't know how to play a G chord, is this the most important thing I should be practicing? In my opinion, no, okay? Because G, you and I, if we're gonna play music together, I need you to know a G chord, because we gotta play some songs, we gotta play some music, okay? So this would be a secondary thing for sure, but if you're already kind of past all of your you know, open chords and different things like that, this is a great thing for you to start exploring is how to play some scales and the technique that goes into all these different things. Okay. So those are the five tips that I've got for you to really think about. Okay. 